first one, uh, and unfortunately I missed the first one as well because they don't let us out of the Midwest that often. But um, this is Freaks, Confs, and Jail. Wow, so there's a lot of more people than I kind of expected to see for such a kind of uh, tough act to follow as uh, Rambum there. Um, so I don't have a presentation with me yet because we brought the wrong laptop, but I'm going to start it anyway because I know what the slides are in my head and you can just kind of visually follow along because who the hell needs PowerPoint or anything like it. Um, so where I'm going to take you back to in, is something that actually is still an active and ongoing scene. It's the cough scene, and that's a, kind of a critical core part of what it is to be a freak from a social perspective, at least. Um, there's obviously a lot of technical freak stuff that has been available this weekend, and I'm sure we've gone over it, but coughs are an area that really uh, is, hasn't been captured by any of the talks so far, and I've never really talked about this before because I don't want to leave in handcuffs. I'm hoping that uh, that won't happen this time. Um, so what's a cough? Uh, let's kind of take you back to the late 80s and early 90s where you know a lot of this got started. To, to be clear, Comps existed before that. Freaks would meet on loops to talk and uh, so forth, but really, you know, toward the end of the 80s, like 86, 87, 88, is when the big teleconference scene got started. So at this time, there was no big internet series of tubes. Um, there was uh, no real uh, scene as far as being able to meet people electronically. Um, you actually kind of met other freaks, you know, in person at 2600 meetings and the like. So what we had back in the uh, late 80s was 2600 Magazine, some 2600 meetings, who uh, some uh, uh, things along the lines of like, you know, local, uh, you know, computer clubs. Uh, there was a pretty active one uh, that, you know, guy you may have heard of, Steve Wozniak, was involved with uh, down in Silicon Valley, and, you know, he was one of the earlier freaks. Um, but there wasn't really the, the kind of online communities that you had now. The closest thing that we had at the time was BBSs, and you probably, you know, SketchCow did, I think, a, a 37 hour long documentary on, uh, on the BBS scene that, that he has for sale this weekend. It says, uh, it says, it says NT load or not found. What? I'm You're, just kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Barcode uh, likes to give me shit about running Windows. Um, so. There's a, there, was, there were some freak BBSs at the time, but you know, basically just to capture the, the way that you interacted wasn't things like IRC, it wasn't things like message forms, it wasn't a lot of the things that you had now. So you really need to put yourself in that space to kind of understand what this scene's about. So um, what, what is a conf? Well, a conf is basically a thing that you can dial into uh, where you can uh, talk to multiple other people all at the same time. And I'm going to try and type my password at the same time. There's, you know, there is never a hope that I've done where things have run on time. And uh, this is actually, I think, the first, not the first equipment malfunction I've had either. So. God, your password is still secret? Um, no. Uh, ran and grabbed my laptop. Um, okay, hey guys, uh, whoever's running AV, can can we get one of these mics turned on somehow? No. All right, you may have to just come. Oh yeah. That worked. It's my talk now. It's your talk now. Can we get his mic on, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. Oh, so are you going to be the uh, the cough operator's friend? Um, okay, are we, do we have video? No? Function F4, do we have video? How many hackers does it take to get a projector? Oh, look at that. We got video. Yay. Yes, it's Vista. Yay. Okay, so we already covered this slide. There's, uh, so how do you meet other hackers? Well, BBS is cops, all that sort of thing. Uh, and so 2600 at the time was more of a freak publication. And so, 
there was like a real big hardware hacking scene in the late 80s, but there was, you know, basically as far as what we did, it was more freaking. Um, it, and that's what a lot of the articles, if you look at older issues of uh, 2600 Magazine, covered. Uh, blue boxes at the time, I'm sure you've all heard of a blue box, especially if you were at the uh, History of Freaking talk this afternoon. They still worked uh, for the most part, and a lot of people were using them. Um, if you dialed into a BBS, you could dial it in a bit rate of 300, 1200, and 2400 BPS, um, which is good enough for text, but not really much in, the, in terms of downloads. Most of them were long distance. Just, does anybody raise your hand if you remember, like, actually getting a long distance bill over $100? I don't know who okay. got my long distance bill. So I'm surprised actually that we have that many people, but if you were a BBS sysop especially, you, weren't a you were accustomed to getting a phone bill at least $500 typically any given month. Um, so toll charges were real. People wanting to find ways to avoid them legally or not was actually um, you know, a fairly big deal. And I got busted just to, you know, to kind of like reveal my age a bit. Um, you can do the math. I got busted in seventh grade. Uh, for blue boxing and for all net codes, if anybody remembers what all net was. Uh, so, class of 1992, still internet access wasn't widely available. There was a big debate raging on the internet, which was still largely an academic and government network at the time, over whether to let AOL on. Um, they probably shouldn't have. Uh, <laughs> BBSs were really in their heyday, and I got in on the game. I was running a, a, the bin BBS, which had kind of a secret area for freaking stuff in it and wares and, and the like. And it's kind of funny because the Dark Tangent and I were both in uh, Seattle, and uh, we traded uh, messages back and forth since we had a, a relay network and, and a lot of, had a lot of the same users. He ran a Dark Tangent system. And 2600, not to be outdone, ran a BBS, but with a twist. It was the 2600 voice BBS. And so if you didn't have a computer, you could call into the voice PBS and you could participate in an online message forum, sort of, except you dialed in. Um, blue boxes, by the, the early 90s, we'd mostly gone to digital switching. And so for the most part, you could still bounce off uh, C5 networks uh, in some foreign countries. Uh, you could uh, bounce off of uh, China Direct, for example. but. It was pretty avant-garde, like the techniques that you know people had learned, like you know dial armory recruiting and, and blue box off of that, uh, off of their toll-free number, largely didn't work anymore. Uh, red boxes uh, still did work, and in fact, a lot of calls to the 2600 voice BBS, most of them is my guess, were made by red box. Uh, I made more than a few of them from the payphone at the school a block away from my parents' house, and. It was considered like, you know, we have netiquette now. Well, one of the pieces of 2600 voice BBS etiquette, which was widely ignored, was don't blow tones into the phone like making fake quarters while you're leaving a message on the voice BBS. So you'd be listening to a message, somebody saying something, and then, it, you know, it'd cut in, please deposit 25 cents for the next one minute. And, you know, somebody deposit a fake quarter. And then coughs, uh, which we talked about already, uh, began to gain popularity. But... There were, were not a lot of conferencing systems, and Alliance Teleconferencing, run by AT&T, uh, was the primary one that people were using. Um, and these things were very expensive. It, you know, typically, you would pay 40 to 50 cents per minute per, per participant. So they were kind of aimed at high-end businesses. So why, if you're a freak, would you want to cough? Well, it's a social thing. Um, you could talk to other people who had similar interests. Uh, on the phone, nobody knows that you're a 16-year-old pimply-faced dork in, you know, Wisconsin somewhere. And very often, uh, when you get a whole bunch of people with a phone and a big ego and a lot of boredom together, um, some hilarity ensued. So, um, Barcode got into the cough scene when he was in high school, and, uh, you know, what was it like, Barcode, uh, coming home from high school, putting your backpack down and calling the cough? Well, I thought you were six feet tall and black the first time I heard your voice on the phone. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I have this, uh, you know, telephone voice that's kind of intimidating and big. And nobody knows that I'm, you know, at the time, 18 and 110 pounds. And I had the same voice then as I do now. Of course, I don't talk like that anymore, but... <laughs> uh, no, I think he's right. It was a very much a social thing, and... Uh, in Sacramento specifically, which we'll get into later, which is where I'm from, we had a pretty active uh, 
hacker community, I guess you could say. This is just around the time the 2600 meeting out there started. And what is that, 93, 94? 2600 meeting. No, 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 in Sacramento. Oh, in okay. Sacramento. Yeah, I think it was 93. Yeah. And uh, the reason we probably got into the comps is because the, a lot of them were based out of Sacramento. There was a telephone company out there that was somewhat less than responsible with shredding their trash. <laughs> That wouldn't Ish. be MCI, would it? Yeah, mm. and and, uh, and the profit here had had uh, ultimately somehow up in Seattle where he was gotten a hold of some of the comp numbers. They were just voice bridges that they'd set up for these multi-level marketing companies. And uh, by the time I first called in, I don't remember what the hell was going on the first time I called into one of those conferences, but it certainly wasn't something where I wanted my voice to be heard. Yeah, so if any of you think that Amway serves no use for anything, they were a great source of coughs in the early 90s. Because what they would do is they'd set up these teleconferences and they'd have all these Amway people call in and they do you know, their big Amway rah-rah meeting, like, we're going to sell stuff, and we're going to show the plan, show the plan, show the plan, and we're all going to be on the diamond yacht, and we're just going to be with Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel and selling Amway. And then they'd hang up, and we'd call in and start three-waying uh, McDonald's and asking them to take their registers apart. But, you know, well, anyway. Well, I also found it, thought it was interesting that they would set those comps up to use for an hour, and they would be up for six months. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is true. Well, sometimes these, uh, you know, these guys would dial, like, uh, we'd be on the cough, you know, doing something, and then all of a sudden, like, eight people would join, and, you know, it'd be like, uh, hi, this is Bob from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, Melaleuca today, and, you know, like, Sometimes this happened at awkward times, like when we were three-wayed with, you know, like airlines trying to get them to, you know, give us free tickets or something. Um, so, yeah, I guess that segues nicely into prank calls. So, um, one of our favorite companies to prank was OCI. And this was uh, an alternate operator service. Uh, so, you know about uh, Verizon and, you know, the Baby Bells and the large long-distance companies like Sprint and so forth. Well. There were a lot of providers that we'd call Teleslees providers that basically existed to rip you off when you made phone calls on your calling card from pay phones by hoping you wouldn't notice that it was like some sleazy provider instead of the real phone company. And OCI was pretty much at the top of that game. And the great thing with OCI is they had this toll-free backdoor number that you could dial into and get an OCI operator, and they had no idea where you were calling from. There was no ANI on this thing. So, um, you're what leaving you, off one important part of information, which is that OCI had a very strict policy that their operators could not hang up on you without manager approval. Yeah, yeah, that was the other best part. <laughs> so it was pretty interesting. You know, they could only make collect calls and the like, but, you know, we'd call OCI and ask them all sorts of really unusual questions. And we try to make collect calls to, you know, very unlikely places that they that we knew they couldn't make calls to, like uh, Libya. Um, it probably sounds less funny than it was, but just put yourself in that place. You're 16 year, years old, you're on the phone with a bunch of your friends, and you're calling somebody that can't hang up on you, no matter how ridiculous the proposition that you put across the line is. And... You know, it really is a lot of fun even now because they still can't hang up on you. Um, yeah, so, uh, oh, 1-800-288-2880, by the way, uh, for, for OCI if you, if you want to try your hand with them. Don't um, do it, please. There was, uh, so, putting yourself back into cellular phones at the time, they were all crackly analog, and we didn't have the nationwide cellular networks that we do now. So often you travel from one city to another and your cell phone wouldn't work and you'd get put through to this uh, thing called Cellular Express, where for the mere oh, low, low price of, I think, three ninety nine a minute plus a $5 setup fee and who knows what else, uh, you could make, you know, domestic phone calls on a crackly analog cellular, outgoing only. Um, well, that was really fun because they had a backdoor toll-free number two, and they also didn't know where you were calling from. Uh, they just thought that you were calling from some part of the country that you weren't in. So... Uh, Magnate, one of the freaks that uh, was on one of the conferences we, we uh, called quite a bit, uh, decided to become Bob the operator's friend. And so he'd call up, um, usually 
at least 15 times a day and sometimes more than that. And he got to know every single operator in this center and find out, you know, what even what the layout of their cubicles was because he just call incessantly and ask so many questions that they eventually just started answering everything he asked and then he'd call and verify with other operators at different times of the day. And, you know, if, if anybody gave him false information, he'd call until he got the operator that gave him fake information and say, well, John, you lied to me. You told me that the chair next door to you was purple, and I know, in fact, it's blue. Um, you know, why would you lie to Bob, the operator's friend? And, you know, it, it eventually got to the point that they knew his voice so well that he'd call up, yeah. and they'd say, hi, Bob, yeah. the operator's friend. Well, he'd, he'd challenge them. And I have to say, first of all, that this guy was just an epic prick. He was the worst person I've ever met. He is, he, is, uh, he is everything that we all try to convince everybody we're not. Like, he is actually a, an unethical... He is a yeah, the guy's a real jerk. Beside, we'll get into the point of why he's in federal prison right now later, but he, not a joke. But he would, I would be in the car with this guy, and he'd be on you know, random cloned brick phone three of the day, and he would call, I would listen to him do this, and he would call OCI, and he would say... Do you know who this is? Well, he'd actually and the, call and, Sailor and, Express. Well, 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 whoever the hell he was calling, yeah, and, he, and, and they would say, Bob, the operator's friend. And he'd say, it is Bob, the operator's friend. Good. I'm not going to bug you anymore today. Send me to another operator. And it would just be, and it, it never ended. And I'm, well, I'm glad the guy's in jail, but we'll, we'll get into that. Well, yeah, but uh, the, the reason that we're glad he's in jail has nothing to do with Bob, the operator's friend, which was really funny, by the way. And nobody does stuff like this anymore, I don't think. Maybe they do. Um, AOL tech support was an endless source of amusement. It didn't used to be, thank you for calling AOL tech support. This is Jim, may I help you? Um, it was, uh, I, I don't know, it, with apologies to any Indians in the audience with a thick accent. Um, you know, it was based in, uh, in Dulles, Virginia, I believe. And so you'd get somebody who spoke English and who had been trained to be really nice to really dumb people on the phone because that's kind of who AOL's customers were. And you could call up and say, now, I'm trying to log, sign on to the interweb and everything, and, you know, when I click on the program, I ain't going nothing but beep beep, and the lights on my pickup truck flash. <laughs> and I think AOL, like, you know, done haywired my wiring on my 68 F-150. And, you know... There were, this was, this was one of the tech support calls that we'd put through, like we'd try to convince AOL that somehow like they were uh, messing up our pickup truck and they try, they would actually very, 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 uh, spend a lot of time, you know, trying to convince us that we shouldn't sue because there's no way that they could have done that and, you know, they, these guys would just dig themselves deeper and deeper. Um, it was pretty funny, like they offered to have the legal department call once. Um, Waffle House, now that may be, seem fairly unlikely. It's like this chain in the Midwest of waffle restaurants. And the PLA, evidently, like one of the PLA members, I don't know quite what the story is, and they'll be doing a panel later, so you might ask them. But my understanding of this is at one point, somebody from the PLA went to Waffle House and didn't get good service from one of the waitresses there. And so having gotten the name of this waitress, they just called her incessantly for, for months and asked her all sorts of questions uh, like, you know, uh, well, I won't get into the kinds of questions they asked. Good because, call. Yeah, 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 because this is being uh, filmed and I don't want to get myself in any trouble. But, and then the last one, and pro not, but definitely not least, that you know, came to mind as far as prank calls was Fred Meyer. Now, uh, Fred Meyer is, if you know what Walmart is, Fred Meyer is kind of like a Walmart, except that at the time they sold random things like lumber and, um, you know, auto parts. Um, but you could dial up Fred Meyer, and if you convinced them to transfer you to a particular extension, then you would be on the announcements, in-store announcement system for the store. And you could make any announcement you wanted over the phone and... Everybody in the store would hear it all throughout the store, and there was no way that they could make this stop except by powering down the phone system, which nobody knew how to do because AT&T ran it, 
and they had to get AT&T out to power the system down. So you, would, you, you were guaranteed that if you got transferred to this particular extension, which I won't say is 900 or 9,000 on here, um, then, uh, oh, wait, um, I didn't say that. Uh, it's something other than that, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they would put you on the in-store system. And, you know, so it was great to make ludicrous announcements. Did you know that if a price of some item gets announced over the in-store system, they legally have to honor it? Uh, so there was an absolute run on bananas one day. Like, people went bananas for bananas. Um, they were only nine cents a pound. It was a great deal. Um, I think they sold completely out of bananas in the Tualat and Fred Meyer. Um, yeah, I had nothing to do with that. And when they shut down those extensions, uh, there may or may not have been some people that climbed under the roof of the building and installed a BBS underneath the air conditioning unit. Well, that, that was extension. at Safeway, but that's a different story. Oh, right. <laughs> um, yeah, BBSs, by the way, could, you know, anywhere that you had a computer and a phone line, you could set one up, and it didn't necessarily need to be your computer or your phone line. Uh, as long as you had a way to power it and some phone line to plug into, then it was perfectly plausible for a BBS to, like, say, be clipped into, like, a credit card verification uh, line at a Safeway that never received incoming calls or did it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we get into the mid-1990s. Uh, by the way, that, those, that BBS, uh, I, I heard, might have contained some very illegal stuff. Um, so in mid-1990s, cops are like really starting to blow up. Um, they're gaining popularity in business. Everybody's using them at this point. And so, well, anytime something gets big, people like us start hacking those things. And so hacking teleconferences really gain a lot of popularity. Um, Alliance wised up. They started monitoring conferences periodically because at some point, some percentage, the percentage of legitimate conferences was eclipsed by the percentage of fraudulent ones. So uh, they started shutting down hacker conferences pretty quickly. Um, so there were the Jet Propulsion Labs in Pasadena, California had a bridge that they only used during business hours and after business hours it was full of freaks. Uh, the, there was a phone company called Citizens Utilities in California that ran a bunch of bridges that uh, we were on. Um, there was a company called Ripple that's still around. Uh, if you go to talkie.com, T-A-L-K-E-E.com, uh, that company's still around. They still run uh, recreational teleconferences. But the problem, remember, long distance costs money at this time. We didn't have these unlimited cell plans that we have now. Uh, they were almost all long distance. So, well, there's ways around that. You, you know, you could set up a toll-free number, for instance. Um, so, of course, toll-free numbers, if you set up a toll-free number, that means that whoever has the toll-free number pays the bill. And we didn't want a bill, so the best thing to do is to take a toll-free number maybe that belongs to somebody else and reroute it somewhere. So uh, a guy named Mega Elite, who was a pretty active freak at the time, uh, he, he's mentally retarded and uh, he's only really good at freaking, but he's very, very good at that in social engineering. He's still sort of semi-active in the scene. As in active, as in he literally brute forces for yeah. I mean, this guy scans by boxes. hand. Uh, if you were at the Telefreak panel earlier, where uh, they were demonstrating, like you know, he's scanning with tone loc, um, Mega Elite just you know dials by hand each number and listens to what happens. There's no no automated techniques for this guy, but he finds a lot of really interesting stuff. And then he's you know, like I said, he's uh, he's mentally retarded, so he doesn't have a job. He has literally all day to do nothing but sit on the phone and talk to anybody who answers and try to be their friend. And he really does want to be friends with anybody he talks to. Um, so, and, you know, I'm not talking smack about the guy. Like, uh, you know, that's just, uh, that's, that's just kind of the world he lives in. So um, he found a phone number that was part of a bulk account belonging to a paging company. And it spelled 1-800-50-SATAN. And he likes phone numbers that spell interesting things. And he was kind of really interested in the occult at the time. So he found that, and it went through to this disconnected pager. So he knew that it was like a, an, a, an 800 number that was up, and then it went to something that was disconnected. So he uh, did a reverse lookup, which you could do through certain, through, um, you know, certain uh, numbers called RESPORG numbers that were operated by various long-distance companies, and found out that a 
long distance company called Wiltel, which is the most ghetto long distance company that ever existed. It's, uh, it's now back in its second incarnation, but they got their start by running fiber optic cable through disused gas pipeline in Oklahoma. It was like kind of one of those weird ideas some cowboy had that actually turned into a phone company. Um, and he called up their knock and got some good old boy in Oklahoma to reroute that number to the wrap line. And the wrap line, like, if you called it, if you did any checking at all, you would never reroute anything there because it answered, what's up? You reached the wrap line and it's right on time. Operator, we don't take no collect third party or credit card calls. You know, and it's like, it was basically like, you know, this, it was the rap line, you know, it was, it was, it was all about hip hop and yeah. How did there you would, get me to, to agree to this? Like, yeah. By the way? I'm sorry. Yeah. There'd be, you know, no legitimate reason to have a toll free number there ever. And it would be obvious to anyone. So, you know, this guy just rerouted it through, didn't check anything. And so this number was up for literally three months and like. You'd call it and it would be constantly busy. The rap line was constantly jammed full of like a combination of hip hop people and freaks, which was kind of strange. Um, <laughs> the, the dynamics got to be, especially when it came to arguments, got to be a little bit interesting. Um, but eventually Wiltel figured out what happened and they didn't just shut the number down. Uh, they did it one better. They were really mad. So. that somebody, some engineer in the Wiltel knock set up intentionally and it said, welcome to our long distance service. If you are experiencing difficulty completing your call, please hang up and dial 1-800-I'm-a-hacker and we've got your number. Thank you. <laughs> I think that uh, T-Love has a recording of that around somewhere still, but um, anyway. Another cowboy named Bernie Ebers, who was building a company called WorldCom that then became one of the largest stock frauds in, in the U.S. history. But before that happened, WorldCom ended up acquiring Wiltel and some enormous, crazy all-stock transaction. Uh, so I, I don't know whether the cowboy got out in time before that happened or what. Don't really care. But the end result was the Wiltel engineers left and the WorldCom engineers came in. And one day, the WorldCom, some WorldCom switch engineer found this. They routed it to this internal um, recording that, that was a special disconnect and thinking that obviously it must have been some, some act of sub subterfuge or sabotage by the outgoing Wiltel staff who knew they were losing their jobs. He did the only logical thing, which was to route the n So in the, in the background, like the cowboy who started Wiltel was, ma was making a deal over back to the rap line, which of course was where it should have been. So it was up for another two months before eventually WorldCom figured out that no, having a toll-free number to the rap line isn't what they should be doing, and that went away. Um, so uh, one triple eight magnate, uh, magnate, the guy we talked about earlier, um, he really wanted a number that spelled his name. So as soon as the 888 prefix became available, he set up a subscription fraud with MCI. Now, unfortunately for magnate, MCI was really wise to this kind of thing, so although he managed to get the setup slipped by them, uh, they had a verification team that would go through and do quality assurance later, and so a week later it got shut down. Um, and then uh, somebody who's not me uh, attached uh, a toll-free number spelling 1-800-JAIL-BOND um, to a different bridge, and so basically, like identity theft, everybody knows what that is now. But back then, like the idea of stealing the identity of a company and signing up for service on the existing account, which is really easy to do. Like, you know, you have an existing account that belongs to some company, and you just want to add additional services. Well, companies always want to sell you more stuff, so it was really easy to do this. And if it was a big company, it could be a while before they noticed and uh, and shut down, shut it down. And this one lasted for six months at least. Um, so, in the meantime, uh, I was living in Oregon and had some friends, one of whom's named the Felon, and he was a felon then, and he's much more of a felon now, and so we'd go out and we'd actually call each other and say, hey, let's go out and commit felonies tonight, and it was very casual. Um, so, 
Yeah, it, uh, fortunately the statute of limitations I think is passed for most of that stuff, but I needed you, you, to get it. You think? I think. Uh, well, you know, there, we, we live in an Keep era talking. where there's retroactive laws where like you break the law if you're a corporation and then we re retroactively pass a law like granting immunity and then, you know, the, the Patriot Act retroactively extended the statute of limitations for a lot of stuff. So I think it's just a matter of whether the police want to arrest you now. Um, but a guy named, uh, well, I'm not going to say his name here because there's people that might run it, but a Secret Service agent showed up at the 2600 meeting in Portland, which I started, by the way, um, <laughs> and was looking for the profit. And around that time, I thought it was a good idea to get out of town. So where do you go when you're from Oregon and you need to get out of town? A small town in Arkansas is a good place to lie low. Uh, I was right down the road from Booger Hollow in a place called Toad Suck, which is down the road from Pickles Gap. And yes, these are all places. Yeah, I've, been, um, I've, I've been there. They're actually real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Barcode actually came and visited. Un unrelated reason. Toad suck. Um, so, yeah, anyway, uh, at that point, uh, there was a lot of stuff going on. And so we did, um, there was a lot of cloning that was happening with cellular phones. Um, one thing that was a popular device was called a DDI. And so, just a quick crash course on uh, analog cell phones. There was no security. Anything that you sent through the air, like your ESN, your min pair, like everything having to do with your phone just got sent completely in the clear. And so the obvious solution that Congress came up with for this, rather than mandating digital technology that would have been more secure, is they made it illegal to listen to certain radio frequencies. And I'm sure that we all in this room would never do anything the government doesn't want in that area. Um, so if you had a Radio Shack scanner that wasn't even modified, it was just a little older than the current year, and you had a computer with a piece of software loaded on it, you could just snarf ESN min pairs out of the day. And an ESN min pair is like basically all the information you need to clone somebody's phone. Um, you could snarf all this out of the air all day long. And so that kind of happened. Uh, we were in Las Vegas, uh, and I remember sitting in a hotel room with you know this guy and a couple other people from Oregon uh, at DEF CON 2, I think. And you know we're just, I have never seen ESN min pairs come across a computer screen as quickly as on the strip in Las Vegas. It was just bam, 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 bam. It was nuts, because you know, where, where are you going to go uh, to clone cell phones except where people are making a lot of phone calls? Um, one of the uh, carriers there, who was the carrier that had the really cool announcements? Do you remember who that was in uh, Las Vegas? Uh, um, well, eventually they got acquired by Sprint, but uh, they, they had some really awesome announcements when you called out. It was, it'd go, da 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 da, and then, your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please check the number and try again. This is a message from the cellular carrier Las Vegas. Um, with, there were Oki 900s if you wanted to clone a phone, and uh, that was a, the most preferred model since you could take a chip out, replace it with a different one that had been programmed with software that would allow you to very easily input ESN min pairs that you snarfed with a DDI or got from other sources. And there were code lines where people would post ESN min pairs and BBSs that were full of these things. Um, and a Motorola Brick was another popular phone because it was a lot cheaper. You could pick them up in pawn shops for like 10 bucks at the time. And all you had to do was uh, solder it to a parallel port and you could program them through your computer. And so, you know, me being broke, uh, that's what I used. Um, at the time, there were manual billing arrangements. You didn't have this electronic billing that you have now, so you could go like trashing for ESN min pairs like at a cellular store somewhere in, say, Mississippi, down the road from Booger Hollow, and then you could take those pairs up to, say, like you know, Seattle, and you could use them for a good month. And then when the bill for a billion dollars like got mailed on paper on like 700 pages to the cellular carrier in Mississippi, only then would your ESN min pair get killed. So you know, having a pair that would last for a long time was kind of a big deal. Um, so there were A and B sides on cellulars. You would have some A side carriers that interoperated sort of and they could do follow me roaming. And then there were B side carriers that used a different system. Uh, B side used a system called Mobile Link and the A in general. And then the A side used a system called the NACN. Um, you know, now you just float, get on a plane, land, fire up your phone and it works and you don't have any of these uh, considerations. But some A-side carriers operated service on both the A and B-side, and U.S. West Cellular was one of these. They operated an A-side system in Omaha and a B-side system nearly everywhere else. So if you took a carrier's 
uh, ESN MinPair and you operated it on the opposite system of them, that was even better because you could receive incoming calls in your market and you would never ring the other guy's phone. So you could, and you know, none of the systems uh, that dealt with follow me roaming linked up. So it was kind of fun. Like, uh, you know, Cellular Freaking was, uh, was, gave a, a lot of opportunities for uh, interesting stuff. Um, the felon, one of our friends uh, who's still active on Telefreak, um, cloned I think half of Omaha. Uh, he was kind of in business for himself, sort of, um, and got a little busted for that. And then one of the best prank calls that we made was, uh, you know, B-String called in uh, to a cough. And uh, we made a call to the White House and needed to urgently speak to the Secret Service to find out, um, you know, whether or not the president used Amway products. You know, this was, this was, you know, after one of those Amway conferences, this was something that we really, really needed to know. So, um, they asked for a lot of information personal about ourselves, and I'm sure whatever we told them was accurate, and then told us that it was none of our business whether the president used Amway products. So I think President Clinton definitely used Amway products. Um, and immediately after that, I've never seen an ESN min pair killed so quickly. Like, you know, <laughs> 10 minutes later, B-String called back into the cough, and he's like, man, fuck you, man. My ESN min pair got all, Nam got all toasty, man. What the hell are you doing having me call that number, man? It was pretty fun. <laughs> um, so uh, then kind of the things came crashing down, and some of us started going to jail. Uh, and this guy is one of the ones who like got busted. Um, Barcode Magnate and Dr. Havoc all got busted in the same week. Um, so like the other thing to kind of keep in mind is that the feds are a lot more clued now than they used to be. Like some phone shenanigans, they're typically willing to not really get involved with if it doesn't really have anything to do with terrorism or like, you know, stealing money or anything along those lines. Um, back then, if you were a hacker, you were as good as a terrorist as far as these guys were concerned. They had not been trained. They didn't really realize that, you know, crimes with computers were the same as crimes with other crimes, and they didn't, or crimes with other mediums, and they didn't really understand, like, what computer crime was. So you were dealing with a very, very aggressive law enforcement uh, atmosphere. And the other thing that was kind of fun was there was a lot of infighting. Like, the FBI and the Secret Service couldn't make up their mind who was uh, responsible for what, and so sometimes you had people getting busted by both law enforcement agencies on successive days for the same things. And that resulted in a lot of cases like not uh, coming off very well. So the feds, uh, to their credit, have much more of a clue now than they used to. So you really have to take yourself back to that time. Um, but Barcode I, uh, he probably ought to talk about his bust. Yeah, I ought to jump in here. I got I to gotta take five minutes from you. So, so I'm at TourCon, Seattle, 2008. And the prophet's about to go up and give this talk. And he says, oh, I'm going up. I'm going to give this talk. I said, oh, that's great. What's it about? He's like, oh, it's about that thing where your mom got pulled out of the shower naked <laughs> at gunpoint. Oh, that's, that's cool. Uh, so, but it did get me thinking that uh, trying to de delineate hacker generations, you can come up with a lot of ways to do it. You can say, oh, the, you know, one generation of hackers existed before you know, your mom had an email address, and that after that, it's the next generation. Or before, you know, pick, pick any type of major topic, before you know, we were charging for domains. But I think that a really good way to delineate generations of hackers is the point at which the feds stopped being the bad guy, or we stopped being the bad guy to the feds. And that was relatively recently. It, you know, obviously, there's still many exceptions to this rule, but there was a point not long ago where I was, you know, us in Sacramento, and this is a story I'm specifically going to tell, I'm going to breeze through this very quickly, but in Sacramento, when the 2600 meeting started, we had an incredibly adversarial relationship with the, with the cops, basically. That 2600 meeting the was... Sacramento County High Tech Crime Squad, which oh, yeah. was newly established and it had something right. to prove. Well, now, there was a good reason they were established, to be fair. So, in 20, Sacramento 2600 was relatively sizable, and everybody there was up to some sort of shady BS. I mean, it was, to be perfectly honest, it was, these were pretty shady people, including myself, to a certain extent. But... Uh, one particular thing happened, and some of you will know about this and some of you won't, but there is a gentleman named Josh Cohen. Uh, his nickname was Pac Bell, uh, rest in peace. And he uh, stole something in the seven figures of hardware from Hewlett Packard and sold it to the mob. And he was a part of the 2600 crew. So this did not bode well for us. As soon as this occurred, uh, we became public enemy number one, and they formed this high-tech crime 
task force, and they were actively surveilling us. This isn't like one of those paranoid things. Like they actually had people with fo like like telephoto lenses on the other side of the mall from the 2600 meeting, and we would just walk right up to them and be like, "What are you, what are you guys doing?" Yeah. So the spot the Fed contest at DEF CON, yeah. like, isn't a joke. <laughs> well, it started out being real. Well, and so, and to be fair, the San Francisco 2600 meeting also had people surveilling us just because they were jerks like that, and they decided to come get us, which was actually pretty funny, to be fair. So, so uh, hey, uh, let's spot the Fed. Who's a Fed? Raise your hand. There you go. Nice. Uh, but they still won't tell you. One of the one of the side effects of this was that being you know young and pretty arrogant, uh, we, it was kind of like an ongoing cold war where we would do things to aggravate them, they would do things to aggravate that, uh, aggravate us, and they even would send undercover officers to the meeting, but we you know we would invite them back to the after party, run their plates, find out they're cops, and walk right up to them and be like you know you're a cop, and they would be no oh, no I'm not I'm like, really because. Just says yar and <laughs> and they didn't like that very much and that happened like three times and at some point you figure like God you know use someone else's car you know it's, like, it's been like three times like th in the same six month period so uh, and and the the thing that really made things worse was that one time there was a particular hacker that uh, as kind of a retaliatory thing he pulled the blueprints of the lead detectives home. And Xerox which you them. can still do, they're public yeah. record for now. Yeah, Xeroxed them and brought them to 2600 and just handed them out. And of course, there was a cop there, and, the, and that got back very quickly. Um, and this happened at a very strange time period. And we're going to rapidly fast forward through a crazy sequence of events. Uh, a couple of friends of ours got busted for some pretty strange hacks. Uh, one thing that happened was a friend of ours accidentally, and this is actually the truth, he, he was trying to break into a system, and that was intentional, and he did, but what he didn't know is that the system was actually some sort of control system for a dam. Yeah, it was a SCADA system, yeah. like controlling yeah. the Columbia River. Or like, so, uh, so the Secret Service or FBI or somebody got called in, he got busted for this. And, and this was I'm, in I'm Canada really, too, like yeah. it was the RCMP that went after him. Yeah, yeah, and so he, he got busted. He kind of gave some information up, but not really. He was actually a really cool guy, and he tried to, you know, kind of protect everybody. But that led to the conf, because he was calling into the conf. So we, the conf started getting monitored by some sort of law enforcement agency, and one by one, they started picking us off. And we knew this was happening, and it started with a guy named Magnate, which we, who we brought up earlier. Magnate is just the worst person ever, and he uh, really wanted to get caught. Like, everything he was doing, <laughs> thank you, C. Stone, he really was the worst person ever. Uh, he really wanted to get caught. He did really, I mean, this guy was, like, on a clone phone in a stolen Buick, driving over metal road cones, throwing up, like, a fishtail of sparks behind him on the freeway with both fingers up out the window. I mean, he was, <laughs> this is not a fake story. It was between Sacramento and Lodi. He actually did this. Uh, and then just play, claimed anger, ignorance. Oh, I was having a seizure or something, and he got, got away with it. Great, great, great BS artist. So he, uh, he, he, <laughs> he gets busted, surprisingly enough, while he's driving around. He's literally on the conf. He's, oh, I'm going to Taco Bell to try to pull some sort of scam, and he drops. And we get really suspicious because some other people had recently dropped, and we call his employer the next day, find out he hadn't shown up for work, call his, he was still in school, called his school, found out he hadn't shown up, and at that point we knew we were completely screwed. I mean, that was it. Uh, sure enough, Magnate gave all of us up. He, by name, gave up my home address, uh, totally dumped all of our docs, and we knew this was happening. This was three days before DEF CON 4. So I'd never met the prophet in person at this point. We all go into, I, I don't know about these guys, but I went into complete fucking panic mode. I'm not going to lie, I was absolutely terrified. It was really scary to think, like, these guys, I've been doing wrong, things that are clearly wrong. I wasn't stealing from people. I wasn't doing credit card fraud. I was actually, on the scale of things, kind of okay, but I had done some things. And these guys were coming to get me. They knew where I lived. My brother called me and said, there's, like, old men taking photos of our house from a, from a Ford. And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> So we all go to DEF CON 4, completely paranoid, get in a, a rental van, drive to the middle of the desert, and essentially have this frank conversation saying, like, okay, what do we all need to know? Because we've, we've been incredibly vague over the phone for the past couple of weeks. We've been paranoid to kind of get our story straight. Go back home. I get back to Sacramento, and a week later, uh, they literally came through the windows at my, at my parents' house. I wasn't there. I was on my way to a 2600 meeting. And... <laughs> And if they knew what they were doing, they would have just gone there. They pulled my mom out of the shower. They did the, it was totally over the top. And this is, this, this is so funny that I, I can't even believe it actually happened. My brother is sitting on the computer in the house, and he's playing Police Quest. <laughs> right? Now, it gets better. It gets better. 
And they, they bust in. They didn't know what I looked like. I don't know how that's possible, but they didn't know what I looked like. And they, Mike Menz, this detective, has, has his weapon. My brother's three years younger than me. And he says, freeze, Matt. And my brother is fucking brilliant. He just goes, I'm not Matt. And he walked out of the room. Like, <laughs> <laughs> nice. The, no, hold on, hold on. So, so, so the cop, no, not my brother. The cop walks out of the room, leaving my brother at the keyboard. And I'm thinking, that's fucking brilliant. You could just like, next time I get busted, I'm just like, I'm not Matt. Delete everything. <laughs> fucking smash it. I could, I couldn't believe it. So they go into my room, and in my room, of course, they found my case open with IDE cables hanging there because the week before I threw my hard drives in the goddamn lake, you know, because I thought they were coming. So we, you know, I'd thrown everything out, and uh, you know, they did get some stuff on me, and eventually I was prosecuted. But what we'd agreed to before this, and I'll hurry up here, is that we. Uh, we had a phone tree in Sacramento. We'd, we'd all agreed that if somebody got busted, we'd call the next, it was seriously like out of a stupid movie. We said, oh, we'll call the next guy and you say a stupid phrase and I'll know. And the phrase, and I swear to God, I've never said this in public and I can't believe I'm about to say it on stage. The phrase, which, which we thought was totally brilliant was, how are your mother's flowers? Yeah. yeah. Totally inconspicuous if you call someone and say that, right? So I, so I, I, I actually did, and this is, is it, to be fair, it worked. I called my, my buddy Pegasus, who was in the scene, I, I said, hey man, how you doing? He said, hey, what's going on? What's, what's new? I didn't see you, you know, the thing last night. I said, yeah, man, how are, how are your mother's flowers? And he just goes, silent. Because we'd never joked about it, and, and so he goes, they're all right, man, hey, I gotta go. And, and to be totally... <laughs> to be... To be, to be totally serious, that it actually worked. It was the end of the BBS scene in Sacramento that day, I mean, to, to obviously to an extent. That he called all the other, it was a very BBS heavy at the time, he called all the other BBS operators and everybody called everybody, and like 15 major, major for Northern California, like, you know, hacker BBSs went down that day and never came back up. And those guys put their computers in their car and they left. And, they, and, they, and so I brought a cassette tape thingy to my interrogation, which I was interrogated at a pizza parlor without a lawyer present, uh, to which I instantly responded to everything with, you know, I plead the fifth, I'm not talking to you pricks, blah, 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 blah. And I tape recorded everything because I wanted everybody to know that I wasn't going to rat them out. And I didn't. And I didn't say anything, and the Sacramento busts stopped at me. But before this had happened, they basically, at, over the past several years, busted pretty much all of us for something. And so we had this the Sacramento Toys and Center group which, with all these people in it, and we had like PerpCon, got busted for the Tower Records thing, and went down for a year, and Josh was in federal prison. Everybody was, everybody was getting busted. Magnate was gone, which nobody cared about. And, and we all thought, you know, this, is, can't, this can't go on like this. Th but it was, it was a characteristic of something that doesn't exist anymore. They looked at us as the bad guys, and we looked at them as the bad guys, so to speak. We were, had an adversarial relationship, and that is a generation of hackers that, that existed in that time frame that if you, if, you know, if you came into the scene, and I'm not trying to say this in a negative way, but for people that entered the scene, and at that time, the relationship with the government, with the feds, with the cops, so to speak, wasn't this in this adversarial manner, you, you, th there was a segment, there was a way that we thought back then that just doesn't exist anymore. And it's, it, it's very positive now, and I'm very happy that, that things are like they are. But if you weren't there for that, it's really difficult to understand what that was like. Because w you were talking about judges who didn't understand what email was, your parents didn't have email address. You, nobody understood when you went into court, when I went into court, and I've got to, you know, I'm trying to explain this stuff to the court. Because they, they were the court, to be honest, was very cool with me, trying to let me tell my own story. It's kind of like, well, so what did you do? Yeah, they, and and they, they, they were asking us as opposed to the prosecution yeah. sometimes, like, what we've done. The, and the, <laughs> the district attorney had walking orders to get me on three felonies and misdemeanor. I, I was supposed to be in jail until I was 18 and on no computers until I was 21 or something like that. And I walked, I was fucking terrified about this. Literally, absolutely terrified, shaking in my shoes, completely scared. And by the time I got in there and I started to kind of walk them all through what was really going on, I swear to God, before I walked out of that room, first of all, I got off with one misdemeanor and 50 hours of community service. Um, yeah. but, but, which the district attorney was slightly less than pleased about. Uh, but the bailiff like turned over to me and he's sitting to my side like this and he leans over and goes, Psst. I, am, I literally am not even sure if I'm supposed to look at him. So I look at him like, mm. he's like, do you know anything about AOL? <laughs> yes. And I, and, I, and I said, I looked at my lawyer and my lawyer's like, mm. and so, so I said, yeah, he's like, because mine's totally fucked up. Can you come to my... Can you... Can you... Can you... Can you, can you, can you
can you like, can you tell me how to fix it? And I'm like, fuck yeah, I can tell you how to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll come over to your house. What do you want me to do? Just get me the hell out of here. And, uh, but, you know, the, uh, fast forward a couple years. Uh, you know, one thing I did want to clarify about what the, what the prophet was saying is that there's a couple things that you never do, ever, 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 ever. You never, ever, ever screw with emergency services doing prank calls, ever. Never screw with 911, never screw with poison control, never yeah. do anything. <laughs> and, and, and actually, that segues really nicely yeah, into, that, into the present day. That segues right into Magnate, and I want to let this yeah. point go because he's the one that narked me out. So this is the guy that basically narked, I say narked me out, welcome to the third grade. So this is the guy that, that ratted me out to the cops, and, and he, you might have seen on CNN a couple months ago uh, that there was some people busted, this is a front page stuff, for swatting where you do is a VoIP, you know, use VoIP and you do this a and I spoofing and you get SWAT called to come to somebody's house. That guy on the front page of CNN, Jason Trowbridge, tr magnate, the same guy that narked us out about, a th about three, four weeks ago, he just got sentenced to 60 months in, in the federal prison. So. Yeah. So uh, this is our last slide and I'm being, uh, being asked to wrap up very quickly, but uh, fast forward to today, cops, they're a dime a dozen, long distance is effectively free and we still use them. Um, because it's still a social thing. Uh, a lot of VoIP freaks hang out on uh, the telefreak.org conf, and uh, you know, if any of you are interested uh, in, in uh, VoIP, that's a great place to get information and kind of hang out with us. Um, but there's a dark side to VoIP, and that is that it's a very new technology. There's a, it's very easy to gain access to SS7 and do all sorts of really nasty shenanigans like swatting. And uh, do, do all of you know what swatting is? Yes, no? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the, I'll give you a really cl quick nutshell of swatting. Effectively, when you call 911, your ANI, which is your phone number, gets transmitted to the PSAP. And I wrote a very, very detailed article about this, I think, two issues ago in 2600. I write the telecom informer column, by the way. Um, so go pick up the issue if you're interested in this. But effectively, if you call up, um, and you're using a certain, vo certain set of VoIP services, you can spoof somebody's ANI and make a 911 PSAP think that some hostage situation is going down so at somebody's house. And they'll respond with, you know, armed cops and a helicopter and all the things that you would hope that the police would do if somebody were holding you hostage in your home and they were armed and crazy. Um, and, you know, people very easily, if you pull this kind of stunt, could, uh, could be killed and, you know, uh, they'd be entirely innocent. So Magnate, the guy's 29 years old and he's still doing this shit. And uh, so he got in, in with a couple of, uh, you know, younger hacker, uh, younger freaks, rather. They started pulling these kind of stunts. And, uh, you know, that's the thing that you deserve to go to jail for. Like, five years isn't long Absolutely. enough for that guy. Yeah. So, All right, I think we're done. And uh, next up, there's a uh, social engineering panel of some kind, which uh, I think will be a around. lot of fun. I, uh, we got uh, Emmanuel and Mitnick in on it. So uh, stay tuned. Thanks. Just a, just a quick reminder, we don't have any uh, paid people that pick up after everybody, so if you could take your beer bottles and your 40s and your, your various caffeinated beverage and, uh, beverages and make sure to put them in the trash cans, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, social engineering is next. Dream.